Thanks so much, everyone. All right, thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, it's great to be here with you, everybody. I'm, I'm Jay, as Sophie mentioned. Uh, if you have been watching uh, machine learning or, or NLP, natural language processing, um, the last few years, there has been some real breakthroughs. Um, one area to understand a little bit of the, of the progress in this, uh, in this area is uh, the superglue benchmark. So this is a language understanding challenge uh, where people and researchers um, can uh, compete on, on specific tasks that are complicated for, for language. Um, over the last few years, we've developed a lot of language uh, you know, models, language uh, machine learning models. Um, and in specific narrow tasks, if you look at, so these are a list of, 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 of models that achieved you know, the top scores on this leaderboard. Um, if you look at number seven, that's the human baseline on, 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 these, on these tasks. And so in, in specific sort of narrow um, tasks, some of these models are exceeding uh, human uh, performance. Uh, and so this just gives you a sense of how quickly machine uh, understanding of language and machine generation of language uh, is accelerating. Uh, we're still, uh, you know, seeing that uh, every every month and every year. So to talk about semantic search, we have to talk about embeddings. This is a quick intro to embeddings. Embeddings are basically representations, numeric representations of text that capture its meaning. Developers would, in general, understand, let's say, something like ASCII. So this is how we currently store um, language or text in, in computers and files and text files. It would happen in, in ASCII or, or Unicode more, more recently. And so if you have a, a sentence like, how's it going? It would be translated into these numbers. Um, we can see so, you know, ASCII does not necessarily uh, support emoji, but then Unicode actually does. And if you use emojis, you can see how they're useful, even think them, of them as, as texts uh, that you can you know, add it to your, to your messages or to your tweets. That's a useful part of the representation. Now, so this is a numeric representation of text that developers uh, should be familiar with in general. Now, this representation of text is good for specific tasks, kind of like checking or validating uh, is an in, is a, a an email uh, in the correct format or not? So things like regular expressions, anything you would do with rep, oc, sid, substringing, splitting strings, uh, and merging them. So in general, string matching and manipulation, we have really good tools that this uh, representation uh, enables and allows. But there are other things that we as humans do with language every day that this representation is not suited for. Uh, that's things like looking for the similarity of meanings between sentences or between words, summarizing long texts, classifying texts, um, and translating it from one language to another. For these tasks, these language tasks that are not just string matching or manipulation, language models and the embeddings that they produce are great for these tasks. We can think of sentence embeddings or text embeddings uh, as these models that translate uh, a piece of text into you know, a vector representation. And then that vector representation can be uh, compared. Uh, so this is a quick view of, of sentence uh, embeddings on, on the Cohere platform. And you can see that questions uh, that are similar in what they mean or what they are asking about would tend to cluster uh, closer to, to each other once you plot that using a dimensionality reduction uh, model. So these embeddings would happen to be in, in many, many dimensions, thousands of dimensions, but we can visualize them by having some of these tools that, um, let's say, compress them down to two dimensions that we can plot and look at and just understand the similarity between, between the two. NLP tech is, is, is developing um, quickly. Even if you're focused on nothing else but following NLP models, um, it's very difficult to catch up. These are some, only some of the major, these are not all of the major things that happen uh, in terms of developments in uh, 
language models and in embeddings, this you know keeps um, evolving and developing. And every month and every week now, we would tend to see something more impressive and something some new capabilities that some of these models are able to do. And it's already in production, uh, specifically with 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 big big tech, and it's in in products that you've. Uh, already used. Uh, so if you're familiar with any of the assistants, uh, if you've used Google Translate or Search or the Smart Com Compose in, in Gmail, um, these models powered by embeddings uh, are being productized uh, very quickly. No area is more uh, promising, but also there's so much potential, but a lot of it has already been realized. Uh, than the area of search. So one year after the BERT paper was released, Google Search had already implemented BERT uh, in, in Google Search, and they call it one of the biggest leaps forward in the history of search. The same with, with Azure and, and Bing. Uh, we recently saw, and James had a great video on this, uh, Spotify use of, uh, of search as well. So search is one of the most fascinating areas, and with that, uh, I hand it over uh, to James. Thank you, Jay. So I'm just going to share my screen one moment. Okay, can you can you see okay? Yes. Perfect. Cool. So, so that was a really, I think, interesting introduction to sort of NLP models and and the vector embeddings that they are able to produce. And now I want to sort of continue from that and talk about how we might pair that with something called a vector database to enable um, what we call semantic search. So on the left here, you kind of have what Jay just been explaining. So we have those NLP embedding models. Uh, they are converting our text into um, embedding or, or vector representations. Within those representations, we have that numerical uh, representation of the meaning behind the original text. What we can do is place that next to, or, or place that within a vector database. So we saw those vectors and with a few like added features such as metadata filtering and efficient search at scale uh, we can start building really interesting and really powerful uh, tools using semantic search uh, can we go on to the next slide oh it's me isn't it <laughs> there we go so when what i mean by placing these vectors uh, within a vector database is uh, pretty much what you can see here. Now, those those NLP embeddings are very highly dimensional, so we wouldn't be able to actually visualize it like this in a 2D space. Uh, but this is a, is a really good example of just understanding how they are actually working or how that process works. So in here, we see we have what are called context vectors. Now, this can mean pretty much anything. It's basically just the data or the text that we are storing. So you're seeing the later examples, we have questions. Uh, in that case, it'd be those questions that we're mapping into this vector space and they would be the, the context vectors in this case. Then when we search, we ask another question and that is, encoded by these NLP models and produces what you see here with this query vector. Um, from there, we can identify the nearest, um, the nearest other vectors that have already been stored within that database. So with, with vector databases like Pinecone, you, there are different approaches. Um, the, the first one, which is not particularly scalable, is called a, um, or uses a exhaustive search. Now, exhaustive search is where you, in, in the previous slide, we have that query vector, you would be comparing that query vector to every single other vector in the, your database. Now, 
when you, you have a lot of data, that becomes quite inefficient and, and incredibly slow. So it's not really useful uh, when we have a lot of data. So then we have to use something called uh, approximate search. And approximate search allows us to actually minimize the number of comparisons that we're producing. And that means we can scale this to literally billions of vectors, uh, which is, of course, really useful in today's world. Uh, another thing that is pretty unique to Pinecone as a vector database is a near instant refresh. So uh, I said, you know, we have, for example, billions of vectors. Um, if you then add a million more vectors and then you query that your vector database um, a split second later, it will actually return results, including those 1 million vectors that you just added. So it's incredibly fast uh, in terms of actually updating your, your vector database and keeping everything fresh. And another sort of key aspect um, of the vector database is uh, metadata filtering. So in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, we just want to perform a semantic search, but maybe we want to um, add a little bit more to that and we want to restrict our search based on the metadata um, aligned with those with those vectors. So maybe in the example we'll use later, uh, we have Reddit data and we have the flares from those posts. Uh, and we might want to filter to only include uh, within the scope of our search particular flares. And we can do that and we can do it incredibly fast with uh, PyCon single stage filtering. Um, and then I'll pass back over to you quickly. Yeah, you can keep the slide. Yeah, I think this is just one slide. So just a quick overview of, of Cohere. So Cohere was founded by uh, ex-Google Brain researchers. We build large language models and the products powered by these models. Uh, today, there are three endpoints uh, that, are, that are served on the, on the platform. So the generate endpoint uh, gives you access to the generation models. It is, these are massive GPT models. And it's commonly used for, you know, to write marketing content, to summarize long pieces of text, um, to pull out uh, key clauses from, from contracts. And these large models, they have few shot capabilities where you can show them a couple of examples, you know, three or five examples of a task and they can, you know, make accurate um, and surprising predictions sometimes based on these, these few examples. So that's the generate endpoint, the first bit. The second one, which is a little bit more relevant to our discussion today is the embed endpoint. And it's a text classification, it's a text embedding uh, endpoint. So you give it a piece of text, it will give you back a vector that is um, a numeric representation of the text that, that you sent it. And this is commonly used for things like semantic search, classification, clustering, uh, sentiment analysis, and, and those kinds of tasks. Finally, our our most recent um, addition is the classify endpoint. And this is the first task focused uh, endpoint. It's built to classify text into categories. We'll go over it a little bit now. You could classify text uh, using generate or embedding, uh, but there are a few steps involved. With generate, you would have to build a prompt and structure it in a specific way. With embeddings, you would get the embeddings and then train a down uh, stream classifier on top of these embeddings. Classify does that seamlessly for you. So if you, and it does that based on the amount of data that you have. So if you have a small number of, of, of examples, it would train a, a generation model to do that classification, uh, utilizing these few shot capabilities of, of the generation model. But if you have a lot of examples, um, it can train a, a model or a classifier based on embeddings or even fine tune your own custom massive embedding uh, model. Um, and the, we see traction for, for, for classify on tasks like uh, content moderation. And that's, that's the overview uh, back to you, James. Cool. Um, so with sort of both of those things that we've just been through, um, I'm going to go through a quick demo uh, demonstrating the Cohere embedding endpoint um, alongside Pinecone. 
So I'll just exit this quickly. And so we'll come over to this. So this is just a quick notebook. We'll just run through it really quickly. Um, and you will also be able to access this. So it's over in this link. Uh, you'll find the slides after the, we'll send you the slides after this uh, webinar. So the first thing that we do um, is we sign up for API keys with Cohere and, and Pinecone. Um, and then it, with Cohere, it makes it incredibly easy to make these embeddings and that um, from what I've seen, incredibly powerful as well. So we just initialize, this is literally all we're doing. We're initializing our connection to Cohere um, and then here we have the Reddit data that we are going to be embedding with Cohere, and then we're going to be placing those vector embeddings within our, our Pinecone vector database. And we can see in here, so we have these titles. These are the questions uh, that I, we spoke about earlier uh, that we'll be storing in there. And in terms of metadata, we can see we have this link flare text, and these are the flares for each particular Reddit post. And we're going to also have a look at how we can use those to perform filtering um, as well. So it's only a small data set uh, for this demo, but like I said, you can scale this to literally billions of records. Um, so all we do to actually create embeddings from our, from our questions here is this. So it's the Cohere embedding endpoint super easy super fast and we're using the the large model as well um, so we can actually see the dimensionality of that large model it's outputting for each sort of embedding or, or vector representation that's how big the vector actually is so we now have our embeddings from cohere and what we now do is we need to place them somewhere so that's where Pinecone comes in. So a Pinecone, again, it's super easy to use. We import Pinecone, which we installed uh, up at the top here. So with these, so we import Pinecone, we set an index name. So this can be anything you want. Uh, for me, I've just chosen this. And we pass the index name, dimensionality vectors, and the metric that you're going to be comparing vectors with. Uh, to initialize uh, basically what I sh what you saw before uh, with that little picture here, your your vector index where we're going to store everything, um, and then we connect to it. So after after that, we we put all of our vectors IDs and also the metadata. So we have that link flare text up into Pinecone, and then we can start actually querying. So to query, it's a very similar process again. So we have our query, I want to ask. Uh, so we're using the, the ask science subreddit here. So I'm going to ask some kind of uh, dumb but curious uh, things that I'm curious about that are kind of science related. So can flown lava exist underwater? And all we do is we embed that using go here. And we need to, of course, also make sure we're using that same uh, model endpoint there as well. And what that will return us is this 496 dimensional vector. And then we just pass that to Pinecone and we pass it to the query endpoint. And then we say, okay, I want to return the top 10 most similar results to that. And I'm going to include the metadata. So the metadata includes that, that flare and also the actual the question. Um, so here we can kind of see the answer, but it's a bit messy. So um, we can actually clean it up a little bit. So we come down to here and what we can see is the actual, the most similar other questions and also their scores. Okay, so far above all the other ones, uh, we have this question, which matches pretty, pretty well uh, when you look at the answers or the comments uh, on that thread they answer our questions straight away. So another one, so with this one, I would just point out, okay, our question was, we mentioned lava, we mentioned underwater, and the, the, 
question that's paired with here also contains those words. I just want to point out that it's actually, uh, it doesn't really matter so much on matching words, but it's more about the meaning. So uh, this one is, what is the Anthropocene? And this is like a some like uh, area that people think might exist. And it's basically where humans have uh, like modified the, the planet through climate change and, and whatever else. And we look at the top other question here, and it doesn't mention anything about the Anthropocene, but it's talking about human transformation of Earth over the past 10,000 years, which is exactly what that is. Um, so it's managed to figure out, okay, those two things mean the same thing. Uh, and that's basically where the, the power of transform models and, and all these um, vector embeddings comes into play. Now, one last thing on this that I just want to add in is I mentioned metadata filtering before, which is, is I think a really cool feature of, um, of Pinecone. So I'm going to skip over this. Basically, we have loads of different flares within these different uh, tags I've added. So I'm going to come down and I'm going to say a pretty similar question. What are the effects of this? Uh, in this case, I'm not adding any filters. And we see we get these, these answers here. OK. Now, if I go down one more, I'm going to add in this filter and I'm going to say, OK, I just want to return items where the, the flare is equal to planetology. And if I do that, we see straight away that we are returning just these. And the way that Pinecone does this is incredibly fast. So we can actually, by filtering, although this is an extra step in the search, it can actually speed up your search time, which is, is really cool. So with that, I think I will hand back over to you, Jay. Okay. Thank you. Share my screen here. Thank you, James. So one thing that was interesting to me is this distinction of you know, these managed services versus running a lot of these models, experimenting with them uh, on, let's say, your own machines. So for me, before experimenting with, with ma managed service providers for language models, but also uh, the semantic search, uh, I was, you know, I bought a laptop that has a GPU and it wouldn't fit, you know, the larger BERT models. I had to work with the, the, the smaller, more distilled ones. Um, I could definitely fit uh, some of these in, in, in a collab, these larger models. Um, but, you know, speed is sometimes an issue. But there's also the, the, the tyranny of having to think about you solving a problem with one model. One thing that I find interesting in, in the capabilities that are, or the doors that are opened by managed services is that you don't have these limitations as a developer and you can chain through multiple steps in the process that use maybe five different massive fine-tuned model for each use case. Um, and that enables you to problem solve at a, a level that I feel is underexplored yet. And, Every day now we see interesting demos about what language models can do. And I don't think we've seen the best demos out there. The best demos will come from developers like you, from simple ideas that you can say, I have this component, I can link it to this component using this data set and you know, present it to users with this sort of fourth component. And one, let's say quick example of that is, yeah, when you have a piece of, of, of text, you can um, get a, let's say, a, a a sentiment uh, classification using your own model. You can get another fine-tuned embedding for it. You can throw that fine-tuned embedding at a semantic search um, engine, get back some results. You can filter them. There's so much potential in, in, in problem solving using these primitives um, that I think is, is very exciting. And this is a little bit of, of the idea of the second idea where we're talking about today, which is that semantic search should not be confined only to the search box. There are other use cases where semantic search can be triggered by, by something else. One example that we have, we have a, a blog post about this is if you have a, a Slack bot 
uh, that listens in on a channel and when it senses, when it reads a question that it can answer, it can possibly do something. And this boils down to a two-step flow. So there's a classification of the questions that happen, that, that come into this channel, and then a, a, a search uh, step after that. Uh, this is another way of looking at it. So you have a piece of text. Uh, the, your bot, let's say, would ask, is this a question or not? And this translates into a, tech, a question classification um, using a, a fine-tuned model. If it's not, then do nothing. If it's indeed a question, the next question the, the bot would ask itself is, do I have an answer for it? Uh, if I search my archive for similar um, embeddings, just like James showed, would I find that answer to that? You know, beyond a specific threshold, for example. If no, maybe do nothing. If yes, what would you want it to do? Maybe you can post it. Maybe you can uh, send it to, to 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 somebody right away. And so, for a quick overview over how to build a a text classification, a question classification um, a model that is fine tuned for for this task, um, we have this this data set. Um, it's a simple data set of questions and non questions. Uh, so there's a text column and then a column of, of classes. So if it is a question that is uh, a value of one, if it's not a question, it's a value of zero. And uh, here we've sourced questions from a data set called squad. Um, and notice that I removed the question marks from about half of the, so I gave it you know a thousand questions uh, and a thousand non-questions uh, or like sentences. Uh, for, for, for these examples. But for the questions, half of them have question marks and half of them do not, because we don't want a massive uh, question mark detector. This is a common pitfall that happens sometimes in, in machine learning, where you feed your model uh, some data that it can use to cheat. So we remove these and just to make it a little bit more challenging for the model. And so this would be a, a, a CSV file that we would save with the text and the label or the class. On the Cohere platform, there's this classify tab uh, and we can choose to, to create a fine-tuned model. We upload that in there. Um, and then there's this button of start fine-tuning and that's all you need to do. And uh, after a little bit of time, it will give you the results uh, for, for the training process. And you can use it both to get the embeddings from, from the, the fine-tuned model um, or you can get the classifications. Um, and this would be the piece of code. It's very close to, so we saw the embedding, the embed uh, endpoint uh, from in James's demo. This is the, the classify uh, endpoint where you just supply your API key and the text that you want and the name of the model uh, that, that is fine tuned. Um, and then that would retrieve to you the, the classification. So it's as easy as that to, to fine tune your own massive uh, embedding model to do classification. We have, so this is my uh, last slide. We have a, a larger, like a, a longer um, guide for how to use uh, the Cohere endpoint generation in this case inside of a, of a Slack app. Uh, you can find this in, in the documentation site for Cohere, docs.cohere.ai. And uh, over to James. Cool. So, what I want to show, and I'm just going to share my screen, is essentially putting all of that together in, in one place. So as Jay mentioned, um, they had this, this blog post where they use this bot um, in, in Slack. Now, what I've done is just spun up a really simple Streamlit app that can kind of demonstrate this. And behind this, the what we're doing is actually, uh, and so we're taking, for example, here, we can ask the question I asked earlier. So can lava flow, flow underwater? And I mean, I can include the, the question mark or not. I'll just remove it. And let me just uh, refresh this quickly. So 
So can lava flow in the water? Okay, so I've asked the question. What has happened there is the question has gone to Cohere's classify endpoint. And it said, okay, is this a question or not? In this case, it's identified, okay, this is a question. And so we have another part of our code that takes that, um, embeds it again using Cohere's embedding endpoint uses pinecone to search for other similar things that we have already embedded and then returns that to us so as you saw in the notebook we we searched for this and we we got this same the same question here and we sort of click on it and we sort of go down if you wanted to you could try and include these answers in there for you and straight away you say okay the answer is no unfortunately so that's pretty cool and you can maybe you can say some other things like um uh, the weather is nice today and you can see okay the the bot knows you're you're not asking a question anymore you just it's a statement so it's not taking you through those extra steps anymore um another thing so you know we can ask you a few more questions so um the earlier one I asked, which was here, or maybe we asked you another question. So if there, if there are a, we'll make this long and kind of long-winded, uh, a practically infinite number of stars in the universe, why, why is this night sky not covered uh, or, or not full of starlight. I put covered. And okay, I'm you know I I have no idea why why is this not the case. And then we'll go through, and we get this other you know, this other question that someone has asked on Reddit. Um, and it looks like it answers our question. We can sort of go on there and we can see, scroll down. And yeah, it looks like that probably, I'm not gonna go through it, but it looks like they're probably answering our, our question there, uh, which again is, is really useful and really cool. Now, going back to the question I had earlier, I'm going to just copy this in. So what are the effects of the Anthropocene? Uh, we'll just ask that. Okay, and we get this. Now, if I wanted to um, limit this to a more specific uh, number of, of flares, so the, the filtering that I mentioned earlier, I can come over here and there's a little bit of code behind this, which basically is saying if I click on social, social sciences here, um, it is going to limit the search to a certain number of threads that I think are relevant. I'm not sure if this is actually uh, the be best one to go for, but it's the one I went with. So here we get, because this isn't a particularly relevant uh, thread, we get a less relevant um, input because we're sort of filtering in, in this sort of wrong place. And then if we want to go to natural sciences, we can ask the question again, and we can see that we're sort of getting something a bit more relevant again. So this is this filtering is, is really useful when you have um, vectors that maybe these different topics overlap a little bit. So you don't want to put them all in different indexes, um, but you want to be able to limit your scope within these different areas. And you can do this with a lot of different things. So for example, dates, you can say, okay, is return me any values or return me vectors that are greater or are more recent than this particular date. Um, so it, it can be really quite useful and, and flexible. So that's it for our sort of mini, mini demo. And we'll just return back to the slides. And I think, yeah, so from, 
from there, um, that's the, the end of our slides, uh, but I know we have a lot of questions. So we'll, I think, start going through those. Awesome, thank so. you both so much. Yeah, we can just start at the top um, with the question on does the clustering depend on the type of embedding model? That's in, okay, that's in the open uh, questions. Okay, so there's two ways, I guess, to, to think about this. So one is how to get a good baseline embedding models that is, that is trained on, on a, lot of, uh, a lot of data. Um, so for specific cases, you can fine tune your own embedding model if you want it to uh, represent a specific type of, 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 of data. So, Fine tuning and training good sentence uh, embedding models is continuing to, to evolve. So since BERT, we had several developments of ways to generate better and better sentence or text embedding uh, baseline models. And to get the best juice for that final sort of performance boost, uh, fine tuning those, those uh, embedding models has to be uh, done to first adapt to the type of text that you're uh, that, that you're using and the type of, I guess, of clustering. So we have a, a post on clustering um, in news headlines uh, in, in, in the blog. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's how I think about it in terms of baseline, you can do really well with what uh, semantic similarities are, but in a lot of use cases, the similarity of two sentences is defined in different ways. So the more labels that you have or the more, uh, text uh, data that you have for your specific domain fine tuning uh, is the next step that will make, will lead to better results. Great, thank you so, so much. Oh, go ahead, James. Yeah, I was just gonna go through. Um, so I think the, the next question is um, on VEX databases. So uh, are, are you referring to the vector database as the way to sort the embeddings of the corpus and not compute every every time on the corpus. So I think, let me uh, cancel live. So I think um, what you mean by this is, so the vector database is both where we saw the embeddings and, um, oh, okay, now I get it. So. It's where we saw the embeddings so that we don't have to do this computation every time. That That is correct. Um, but, but at the same time, it's it's a lot more than that. So it also um, acts as our method for searching through all of these different embeddings. So as I, as I mentioned before, if you have millions or, or even sometimes billions of these embeddings, and you were just going to go through and compare all of them, uh, you, you'd be waiting a very long time. Uh, this vector database not only stores that many embeddings, but it also allows you to search through them in a really efficient way using approximate nearest neighbor search. Um, so yes, it, it is where we store things, um, but it's also a, a little bit more than, than that as well. Um, so next question is also on, on approximate search. So approximate search is like dropping a centroid and finding uh, closest neighbors. How do you determine the distance? Is it fixed uh, or, and can you change it in your search query? Um, so it depends that there are approximate search methods that are like this, but not all of them. Um, so th there's different approaches to it. Uh, with Pinecone, you can get a very good um, estimate of your distance because you're not really worried about um, doing this um, sort of dropping a centroid and, and trying to find or, or trying to guess the, the distance from that. Um, but yes, there, there are some algorithms that, that do that, uh, but it's not really a, a problem in, in this case. Um, so the next question, I think, 
I think maybe for you, Jay, is um, what happens when the input, I assume, to the embedding model includes not just text, but also um, tables and images. Yeah, so Cohere's model focus on, on, on text for now. So you the sort of um, the SDKs will not accept uh, things other than, than, than text, but there are other models in, in research and in open source that are multimodal that can handle uh, a bunch of these modalities. Yeah, I think you can find models that are specific for, for tabular data, uh, other for others for text, and, and some of these that are fusing uh, more than one of these of these modalities. But uh, uh, Cohere's focus is on is on language processing, and so that that does not extend to uh, those other modalities at the moment. Cool. Um, I see this other question here. Uh, maybe can both have some input on, on this um, about the so so does what um, so they have this query. Does your bank offer vacation to its employees? And the top five most similar sentences to that are, are not really relevant, but they're all scoring between like zero point five nine and zero point six six. So in this case, the, the score is obviously deceiving because they're not really semantically similar, even though the score is relatively high. Now, looking at these scores, to me, it, it looks like a sort of off the shelf, like maybe BERT model or, or something. Um, I think the, the main sort of approach here would be to fine tune the model on your particular data. Uh, but I, I imagine Jay probably has some, some good insight there. 100%. That, that hits sort of the distinction that we made. So the definition of semantic similarity can be vague. And these uh, methods for training these models try different things that are general, but then you'd have to fine tune it for, for your own uh, use case and for your own task. Um, because the, the, the vagueness of, of the problem is to say, you know, if somebody said, uh, I really like this movie and another sentence is I did not like this movie. Would these sentences be completely opposite or would they be kind of similar because they're both talking about opinions about a movie? That's part of the um, how this problem of, of similarity is not sort of well defined. It's underspecified. Um, and so fine tuning usually uh, for the end case that, that you want and for the specific use case is, is needed to get these models to do what you want them to do. Um, okay, so what's this next one? Uh, I have a question. <clears throat> so I have a question regarding the sequence of the words. Uh, oh, I have a question. Does the sen sequence of the words in a sentence really matter? Um, so with query, flour and grain rice, uh, if you'd like to add more attention to the word rice, is it possible to do so? Um, and I'd like to return rice as a top match how could I improve that? And in this case, they're using the universal sentence encoder model. Um, I think, again, it's probably pretty similar. It's a case of fine tuning. Um, oh, it also, regarding the initial question, the, with most transform models, you will, are, the sequence of words is, is pretty important. Uh, Jay, I imagine you have more on that. Yeah. So. I mean, there are different ways to tackle a use case like this. Fine tuning uh, does a few things. So the baseline embeddings, you know, have a have a definition of, of semantic uh, similarity, uh, and then you you need to fine tune it on on a specific use case to say, okay, what are similar questions to each other? The questions classifier that we've uh, gone over here that also creates an embedding model where questions cluster in one side of the embedding space and sentences that are not questions live in a different uh, piece of that uh, embedding universe. Um, for, let's say, more advanced use cases of, of semantic search, you can, or like question answering, you would cluster a question with its answer. Uh, so we'd have an a, 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 a embedding space uh, of that structure that you would generate through fine tuning. And so, yeah, it seems that if you want to solve this, if you think that, uh, yeah, large language models are, are, are the best way to solve this, um, this is sort of one way. And then another way is to say, 
maybe when you're averaging the tokens uh, for, for the specific words, uh, you can assign more weight, uh, but this is a solution that you'll have to go deeper into sort of and implement uh, yourself. So these are just yeah, a couple of ideas on, on, on this question. Cool. Okay. Um, so, uh, so this is this is one for you, Jay. Um, this this embedding support other languages like French, Arabic, um, or do they need to be fine too? Yeah. So here's focused on on English um, for now. So yeah, both on the embedding side and the generation and classification sides, uh, English is, is is the main supported language now. If you want to want it in more languages, let us know. We we would love to know what your priorities are. Cool. Um, how good are the embeddings for single words, knowing that the lack of context inhibits the ability of most transform-based architectures to exploit semantic and linguistic relations in a fluent piece of text? I, I think, if Jay, maybe you have some So it, it depends there. on the task. What are you trying to do? Uh, Part of the training objective of these models associate uh, having good representations for, for the specific tokens. Uh, so I, I would suspect that uh, you need to measure it on, on your specific task. Um, but in general, I, I would expect it to, to, to work well on, on general uh, use cases. Cool. Um, so another question, so this one, about pinecone is what is the advantage of, of this over Elasticsearch? Um, so pinecone, the pinecone first and foremost is vector search. That that's the the whole point of pinecone. Um, so that's been our focus, and that's what we're like good at. Uh, Elasticsearch, they for the most part they have been doing what we'd call a sparse vector search. So almost like um, matching keywords using algorithms like TF-IDF or BM25. Um, and Elasticsearch are really good at that. Um, but recently as well, they have started to um, look into, into dense vector search. Um, so they also have that uh, feature, but like I said, Pinecone, it's our complete uh, focus. So um, I think we do it relatively well. And we have a few features like the single stage um, filtering, the very fast uh, index updates, and the, the scalability uh, that I don't think Elasticsearch is, is quite there yet. Uh, but of course, it, it really depends on your on what you're trying to do. Um, so next question is, am I overkilling the problem by using contextualized models? This is in reference to that question about, about corn. And this is a really good question, actually. Um, so yes, there are a lot of use cases where the first tool that you should reach out to should not be something more, more sophisticated. Um, so if you, can, if you can solve the problem with, with a smaller model, um, that is usually you know, a good way to think about about these problems cool um next question so the metadata filtering is like indexing in typical rdbms uh are you using lucene um i don't think so so with with this um so pinecone we have our own sort of proprietary uh index and in this case no, uh, it isn't because it's, as far as I know, Lucene isn't able to support both the, the vectors and the, or the dense vectors and the metadata um, search at, at the same time, like, um, like we have at Pinecone. Um, okay, so this is one for you, Jay. Uh, what is the search sentence max size? Yeah, I would refer you to the uh, documentation, API documentation page. Um, at the moment, you get the best results uh, with texts that are shorter than 512 tokens. Um, you know, think about, about a token being maybe three letters. 
uh, but the actual sort of context length is, is about 4,000. So you can fit 4,000 tokens, um, but the, the shorter ones, you get, you get better representations. Um, so okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so next question. Um, so one for, you, one for you, one for me. Um, so Jay, what, what are your four, thoughts on using a larger model like T5XL instead of BERT with the argument that BERT would require fine tuning, whereas T5XL won't? Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what use case you're sort of uh, referring to. So yeah, large generative models can work on few shot without training. Uh, so we see this with, with, with large GPT as just as, as we see it with, with large uh, T5 models. Uh, but yeah, it depend, really depends on, on the task that, that you're after. Um, uh, I think that's, that's the best I can address this. Cool. Uh, and then the, the one for me was, uh, what would be the best way to fine tune the parameters of the index? So if you're using Pinecone, you don't need to. Pinecone uh, handles all of this for you, which is, is really nice. Uh, if you do end up using something like face for example and you you need to go into all the details um it's i don't know it, it takes a, it takes a long time to get it right um so it's almost like a, a case of just learning everything you can about um vector indexes and vector search and uh, playing around with the with the parameters of your particular um index as, as much as you can So uh, next one, um, this one's for, for you, Jay. Does the fine tuning process actually modify the embeddings as well? Yes, uh, it does. So there is a, a way to you know, create a classifier without fine tuning, but fine tuning actually yeah, trains the model and splits off your own custom um, uh, language model specifically trained on, on the data set that you give it that you can pull the embeddings as well as, as the classifications if you've done this through the classify. Uh, cool. Um, so the next one, uh, again, this is for, for you, Jay. Um, so the, what, do you have any sort of performance comparisons between a 768 BERT-like dimensional embedding versus Cohere's um, 4,000 embeddings? Um, for a billion scale data set. So maybe it's a bit of, it's for you and, and for me. So we have a, a couple of benchmarks. Uh, one on, you can find on the blog, um, another one on, on the website. So the one on the blog is a common embedding uh, task. Um, it covers, let's say, I think a number of maybe eight or 10 tasks uh, called Centival. And that gives you um, a comparison versus not BERT, but the best, current best open source um, uh, models. But then this is for you know, tasks that would include things like classification. So it's not, it's not specifically for, for, for search. Um, the frustrating thing about uh, uh, machine learning is that it depends. In a lot of cases, what is your use case? Try it with some of your, you know, with some of your own data um, and it, it should you know, show you the, the best results for that specific sort of use case. But yeah, those are the benchmarks. Uh, you can find them uh, in the blog, and I hope they can uh, shed some light over uh, that comparison. Cool. And then, and then, in terms of uh, the same question, but for billion scale um, data sets, in terms of the search performance, um, obviously, if you have a high dimensional uh, vector within your uh, within your index, you will need more memory. Um, so, you know, it's whether that works with the sort of potential performance increases in terms of the, how much information that vector is representing for you, um, whether it's worth that or not, but with your, with your vector database, there are ways that you can, um, you can increase the amount of the processes that are processing everything for you to maintain all of this at the same um, speed so you're not going to lose out in terms of your actual uh, latency uh, times 
we are at time right now. If either of you have, you know, a couple more minutes to answer more questions, um, that's great. If not, we can call it here and post some of more answers on our community page, um, which I will be linked in our follow-up email to come out tomorrow. Um, James and Jay, do you have to head out now? Which is totally fine since it is time. <laughs> I do have to run, but happy no to answer the questions. Uh... Yeah, we will get a question report um, after this is done uh, and we can, I can send you the cohere specific ones or just all of them so that you can uh, answer them and we can put them at your leisure and we can put them on our community page. Um, thank you all for coming. Again, you will receive um, the slide deck, demo notebook, and the recording in an email tomorrow. Feel free to share those widely. Um, thank you so much, Jay and James, for this incredible presentation and answering all of these questions. And thank you all for being here. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.